Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. What I'd like to talk to you about today is cataract surgery, how we do it, why we do it, risks involved, and a little bit of question and answers. I'd like to start out talking to you about an anatomy of the eye. So as you're looking at the scale model, I am tapping on a clear structure, which is called the cornea. The cornea is clear, lets light go into the eye, but protects the inside of the eye from the outside environment. The cornea is kind of dome-shaped and again clear, and everything that you see when you look in an eye is actually behind the cornea. So if we're now in the eye, kind of making our way back to the retina, behind the cornea, inside the eye, is a colored structure called the iris. It can be blue or brown or green. And in the middle of the iris is a small little black spot called the pupil. But interestingly enough, the black spot is a spot as a whole. It's an opening, as evidenced by my finger going through it. So by having an opening in the pupil, the pupil then channels the light, when you're looking at me or an image, going through the cornea, channels it through the pupil into the eye. So now that we're through the pupil and behind the pupil, there's another structure, and it's called the lens. The lens is a clear structure, kind of round, straight on, oval, on side view. And the lens sits just behind the iris and pupil such that when the light goes through the cornea, passes through the pupil, it must go through the lens. The lens then takes the light and focuses the light onto the back of the eye called the retina, so we see. And then the light goes back to the optic nerve to the brain. Kind of a simple system, like a camera, in all honesty. Um, what we really want to talk about is the lens. The lens starts out in life being clear. As we get older, it gets yellow, it gets cloudy, it develops opacities. That process is called cataract formation. Cataracts aren't films, they aren't growths, they aren't extra tissues. It's just a clouding of the lens. Um, and as a natural age change, when we get wrinkles on our face or gray hairs, those are natural age changes also. The problem is, when the lens gets cloudy, several things happen. Um, it changes the focusing. So as we get older in our 40s and 50s and 60s, if you start needing changes in eyeglasses, why that happens all of a sudden versus earlier on, is that as the lens changes the prescription, we can keep up with glasses. But at some time, when the opacities or cloudiness gets too much to handle, we can't overcome that with eyeglasses. You may need cataract surgery. Or if it gets cloudy, instead of focusing light on the back of the retina, light gets scattered. So if you would look at an oculing headlight, you'd see rings around lights or halos, that kind of thing. And so when it, the vision decreases to the point that you're not happy, it's worse than 2040, you can't see as well as you'd like to see, then what we want to do is we want to remove the cataract and you have to replace it, because this actually is a focusing apparatus. And we replace it with a man-made piece of plastic or silicone called a lens implant. A couple things about cataract surgery. The this is a scale model, by the way. The lens is not a small piece of tissue. It's about as big as the colored part of the eye. Okay. So if you look at me, the diameter of my iris is about half of an inch. So is my lens in my eye, so is yours. So the lens is about that wide in diameter. It's about that thick. It's a big piece of tissue. And what some people think, and hopefully through the videos, if not, I'll correct your thoughts, is people used to think that we take cataracts out with lasers. No one does. Hasn't happened yet. There's some studies going on trying to use lasers to assist in cataract surgery for breaking up tissues. But truth be told, we don't use lasers. Lasers remove thin membranes, small pieces of tissue. Um, this is big. What we use is something called ultrasound. Ultrasound is sound energy, laser is light energy. Similar, but not the same. And no one does it. So if someone said, oh, I had laser cataract surgery, probably because the doctor didn't say anything to him, because why get why enter a conversation that's going to take three or four minutes? But it's ultrasound, and everyone uses that. Um, lasers can be used after cataract surgery to remove a membrane. I'll mention that a little later. Now, since the cataract is in the eye, it needs to come out of the eye, which means we have to make an entrance into it, so there's cutting involved. Um, in the old days, go back about 10 years, what we used to do, and you may remember if you had family members or friends, we would take a knife and cut from one end to the other end. So it's about that long. Still a small incision relative to the other parts of the body, but in the eye it's a pretty big incision. We would open the eye up and we'd reach in and pull out the cataract and put an implant in. We would then use sutures, stitches, and put seven of them in around the top and close it up. 
and over the next two, three to four months, we would selectively remove stitches until the end of that time frame, you'd get some glasses and you would see. And people would be very thankful because we would really wait till the vision was really horrible. Or the cataracts had to be ripe, which meant we didn't see diddly squat. And then people would be great and, and see well. But we don't do that anymore because our incisions have gone from very long to shorter and shorter and shorter, almost to the point that our incisions are now just really stabs. Think of the old analogy with gallbladder surgery. When I was in medical school, we took a knife and went from here to here, and we had to open things up. Now we make five little incisions and just put little tubes in, and through these um, small incisions, we can move things around and, and cut things out, which is very nice. We do the same thing. We make two little incisions in the eye. We put instruments in the eye. We control them with our hands, and we have foot pedals to give us some other extra control. Um, also, we need to get behind the iris. So let me tell you how we do surgery and then um, what you should expect. So on the day of surgery, you all come to this building. There's a surgical center on the first floor called the St. Louis Eye Surgery Center. And when you enter the center, besides signing some more papers, we'll start the process of getting your eye ready for surgery. That will include dilating your pupil. The pupil's going to dilate, and through that pupil is how I'm going to enter to remove your cataract. We'll start numbing your eye up with numbing drops, which you've had here in the office when we do tests on you, and numbing jellies, that really kind of make your eye impervious to pain. Um, and that is in contradistinction to what we used to do 10 years ago. We used to give you shots. Most people, we would give you an IV, knock you out, put some shots in and around your eye and the soft tissues around the eye. And you'd wake up, you wouldn't know we did it, we'd do the surgery, we'd put a shield and patch on your eye, and that's how you'd go home for a day or so. We don't need to do that anymore. We numb you up with jellies, which is A, safer, because there's no needles, and B, you get to actually put drops in and you can start medications that day and actually see out of the eye when you go home that day. Um, so when you're in this surgery center, you'll also get an IV, and the IV is to check, basically numb your brain. So we'll give you a little mixtures of Valium or Propofol or Fentanyl um, to make you so you're comfortable, but not you know, snoring, you're not going to be out, you'll be there talking to me. Um, and I like that. I kind of can sense how you're feeling. You tell me if you're anxious, we can give you a little more. And the good thing about keeping you awake is if you're not going to sleep, it's safer for you. And then you can recover a lot faster and go home and have a nice afternoon. It's similar to if you've ever had a colonoscopy before. Um, we don't knock you out that much, but you can still go home and function. So uh, you'll be on a, uh, a gurney or a bed. It's fairly comfortable, either or not. And we'll move you into the operating room. We'll prep your eye with certain special soaps and antibacterials. Put a drape over your face, but you won't feel claustrophobic because it's kind of clear. And also, you've had some medicine through your IV, so you won't care. Um, and then I'll be sitting on the tree, being told you'll be happy. And I'll be sitting on the side of the bed. We actually sit down when we operate. We're very, it's a very gentlemanly surgery. Um, and then we'll put a speculum in your eye to hold your eyelids open. And you won't feel the speculum because we want to move your eye and your eyelids with the drops and ointments. And the surgery, where the fun begins. Um, we enter the eye coming from the side where the ear is because there's a lot of space here between the speculum. And where the white part meets the colored part of the eye, we make our little incisions. Now, my model doesn't do that, so I'll have to open it up. But the, the, the big incision that we use is now moved from about 14 or 15 millimeters, a little more than half an inch, to 2 to 2 and a half millimeters, so less than a tenth of an inch. So it's about that big. And the small incision is 1 millimeter is that little commercial from the old Virginia Slims commercial years ago, it's a millimeter. It's really small. And through these in openings, we'll put instruments. So let's talk about how we will move your cataract. I guess I'll stop here for a second to tell that we actually don't remove the whole cataract. Okay? We actually try to segment it in the eye, leave parts of it, which we're going to use to our benefit, and remove other parts. As I told you, the cataract is this round piece of tissue, and it sits behind the pupil. It just doesn't sit there. It's actually held in place. And it's held in place by ligaments. And these little ligaments and tendons insert from the inside lining of the eye called the retina into the skin of the cataract. The cataract has a consistency like a grape. I like to use food analogies. It's got a skin, which we call a capsule, and a pulp, which we call the nucleus. And the ligaments insert into the skin 360 degrees, and it, it suspends the lens behind the pupil. So that's how it stays there. What we try to do is open the skin up, remove the pulp or the nucleus of the cataract, leaving an intact skin, 
which is held onto the ligaments to be the receptacle for the implant. Otherwise, if you didn't have a receptacle for the implant, the implant would kind of float around dry and be totally not helpful. So, what we do is the first instrument that will go in the eye is a little instrument that will make a round opening or tear on the front surface of the skin of the cataract. It's like peeling the skin off a grape as you might have done as a kid, which I did all the time, very ironic. Um, then the next instrument that goes in the eye is this ultrasound apparatus, which we call phaco emulsification. And this ultrasound will go through the opening and impale itself, so to speak, um, in the cataract. And what it does, and this is another analogy, the ultrasound acts like a mini jackhammer. It's not a jackhammer, but just so you know, as it goes back and forth, it sends out sound waves, which pulverizes and breaks up this thick piece of tissue into a liquid. And there's also a vacuum apparatus attached to the uh, chopper, so to speak, which just sucks out this kind of mush. And if we've done our job correctly, the pulp is then all removed, leaving an empty sac. Um, just so you should know, also in the old, old days, you know, people said, oh, could I see my cataract after we pulled it out? And we showed them this little yellow thing sitting in a little tube. We didn't give it to them sometimes. If you ask me now, all you'll see is a big yellow bag of, like, yellow colored Gatorade, okay, because it's all liquidized, so there's no cataract anymore, it's all pulverized. Once the um, cataract is out, we then need to put the implant in the eye. A couple things about implants. We have different styles and shapes made out of plastics and silicones, but they're all the same size. That's because everyone's sac and cataract is the same size. What they differ in is the strength. That's because some of you are nearsighted and some are farsighted. Some have long eyes, some have short eyes. We've measured that back in the, uh, in the office. And what we try to do is pick an implant that will get you close to your, or you get your prescription close to where you won't need an eyeglass to function. You'll be able to get around and you can look out a window and see a uh, house across the street. You can see your television, but it may not be sharp. And we'll talk about eyeglasses and, and crisping up the acuity after surgery. But the point is, the implants are the same size, different in strength. The problem is the implants are have averaged between 6 millimeters horizontally and 14 millimeters length, and the opening is 2.5 millimeters, which means the implants don't fit in. But we have another solution for that. Hopefully you can see this way over there. So this is how we go about getting implants in your eyes. So this is a scale model. That's not a scale model. It's a drawing of a scale model <laughs> of an eye situated like this. So that is the cornea, that's the iris on the side view, that opening here is the pupil. That's the lens of these ligaments, and we're going to tell you how we do this. So we'll kind of start here. So we're going to recap. Cataract, side view. What we'll do is, as I told you, make a little circular <coughs> opening on the front surface go in with this um, ultrasound apparatus, chop up, sorry, always one there, and then we'll chop up and remove the pulp, leaving an empty sac. And then we'll want to put an implant in. Let's talk about the implants. Implants have different shapes and styles. And this is looking at a top view looking down at the implant. Some have these round openings that are 6 millimeters in diameter and are overall with these little springs that are 14. Some have the 6 millimeter diameter and little plate haptic so they can bend. But, and when you look on side view, they look like this. That's the optic. That's the optic and that's the overall length. What we want to do is get through the small opening. Because they're made of silicones and plastics, they're malleable and can be manipulated, and so we roll them up. So we roll them up, if you think about rolling in a paper in your hand into a little tube, so we can make these big, long things into little tubular structures. We then take an apparatus, aptly named a um, shooter, I don't know why we call it that. To me, I like analogies, it's like a straw. And we'll put the straw through the opening, through the pupil, into the sac. It's like a little tube. We'll roll up this thing so it's like a paper on side roll, or side view, it looks like a scroll. We put it inside the inserter or the shooter and push it down into the sack. It then unravels into a side view. 
stabilizes in the sac behind the pupil. Pull that out, check the wounds. If they don't leave, you're done. Uh, sutures are required, in, you know, in the old days it was 100%. Now we do it about 5 to 10% of the time if we don't like the way the, the wound looks for safety measures. But typically we don't need sutures. We check to make sure you don't leak, and that's a nice thing. And that's cataract surgery. It takes about 10 to 15 minutes. Um, works really well. Um, any questions about cataract surgery at this time or so far? Yeah. 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 You said you kind of take, um, it's like a grape and you take the inside out. Mm -hmm. Well, is the skin, would, you, would it still be like yellow and cloudy and stuff? Great question. That's a really good question. Um, no, not initially. So the skin is still part of the cataract needed to hold the implant in place. But over time, the skin can become cloudy again. And, and that happens in a lot of people, actually. And if the skin gets cloudy, it gets a little thickened. And it doesn't matter to us until or unless the cloudiness goes behind the pupil. That's where all the light goes through. If that happens, and it's about a 30 to 40% on all comers, then we need to remove that. 20 years ago, we used to go back to surgery, put shots around the eye, put a needle in the eye, behind the implant, open it up. What a hassle. What we do now is do something called an, a YAG laser, which we've been using for about 24 years. Lasers can remove small, thin membranes. And this is where we would use a laser after cataract surgery. We'd situate a microscope like we have in our office, focus the laser <coughs> through the cornea, through the pupil, through the implant, focus it right there, and we would then use a laser to make a similar opening like I did in the beginning of surgery that day of surgery there. And all you need is to have an opening to let the light through uninhib uninhibited. You still need to keep the sac that holds the implant in place. When that is done, then it, it's not that doesn't happen again. That happens about 30 to 40 percent of the time. How, over what length of time? That's a good question. We will never do it before three months. Average between six months and two years. You know, and just because it's cloudy, you don't jump in to do it. I patients I follow are cloudy. I mentioned it to them. They're still 2020. So you don't do laser surgery until like with cataract surgery until it the vision drops. It interferes with your lifestyle. Then you do it if necessary. Great I was question. just wondering that since it's happening in 30, 40 percent, why they don't, just don't make it part of the procedure and just do it for everybody. Risk. Because if you, and we'll talk about that too, because you'd rather not, there's actually stuff, stuff behind the cataract, and, and that is the vitreous jelly. And during surgery, losing, having, getting a hole in the, in the capsule, and if this jelly should present itself, then it makes it a little more complicated. Um, when you do it in a controlled situation afterward, where the eye is totally pressurized, there's no openings, the opening to capsule can be made with laser, and there's no, f no change in the, in the uh, movement of the jelly. Makes sense. Yeah. So. And why people just don't do it, you know, prophylactically after surgery is, is a cost factor. And there is a risk to this. The risk of doing laser is the same as the risk of cataract surgery, but yet there's no risk of infection if you're not going in, but you can still get some of the risks we're going to talk about now. So you just do it when it's necessary, not just because you can. Um, so let's talk a little bit about surgery success. I would tell you nationwide, uh, cataract surgery is successful 95 to 96% of the time, which means that Patients will see to the best level of the ability that they can, that they saw before cataracts developed. There's still about a three to four percent chance that you'll see that you'll have a complication. You'll still see better than you do now, but you might not be as good as you or I want you to be. Most of these complications are preventable, and I want to talk to you about that. And if we catch complications early, we can avoid major problems. I'd like to talk to you about them right now. Um, 1% of all comers that have all eye surgery the minute you enter the eye, patients can develop a retinal detachment. If that should happen, if your retina should detach, symptoms are new floaters, new flashes. This is after surgery, or before surgery for that matter. And if you have that, you'll come into our office, we'll look at you. If you should have a retinal hole or tear or detachment, <coughs> we'll refer you to one of the three retinal groups in town that are absolutely excellent, and they can fix you. The sooner we catch it, the better. So if you notice floaters or flashes, at any time, you should call us and we'll take a look at you. The other complication, which is very common, but we're able to stop most of these from happening, is something called macular edema. The macula is part of the retina that you see. Edema is another word for water. So swelling of the retina. Now what happens is 
even though we operate way up in the front of the eye, the eye is only an inch and a half long. One can get inflammation in the inside of the eye or even back to the retina. And if that happens, the retina can swell. If that would happen, your vision, which you've been doing very nicely, can decrease. Retinal swelling, if it occurs, doesn't happen at day one, week one, week two. It usually happens at week three, four, or five. What I can tell you is if we do no medications, which never happens, but if we did no medications after surgeries such as steroids or non-steroidal eye drops, then the rate of retinal swelling is about 16%, which is not very good, which would mean if I had a 84% success rate, I'd be out of a job and patients wouldn't be happy with me. If you, we found studies that if you do these medications after surgery for a week, the rate drops to 7% for two weeks to about 3%. And if you use it like we asked you to for a full month, the rate drops to about one half of 1%, which seems to be the lowest thing that most people can get. So if one uses these medications like we ask you to, I'm not expecting you to develop retinal swelling, or at least one in 200. That means that 199 of 200 don't. The reason I mention that is, I hope that within a couple days or a week or so, you're seeing really well. And what then may happen is you're using these drops, and we're asking you to use the drops, and they're not cheap, um, and you're doing well, and you may say, well, look, Dr. Birdie's having me use this, and I'm doing fine. I really don't want to spend all this money and be hassled for using my eye drops. That's where we would get in trouble. If you stop your eye drops, then three or four weeks later, you develop retinal swelling. And trying to get retinal swelling better can occur, but it includes drops sometimes every two hours, sometimes pills, rarely a surgery. You'd like to avoid it. So by doing this prophylactically, so to speak, we stop having any problem. So the net upshot is, do what I tell you to do, although I just explained to you too why. Um, other things we can talk about are bleeding and infection. Bleeding, which had been a big problem <coughs> for us, usually was bleeding in, but mostly around the eye, which happened when we would give shots to numb up your eye. Because when we would give shots prior to surgery, the needle would go through the skin, and I don't know how good you are with needles, but I'm as good as anyone else, which isn't very good. We know where the big vessels are, we know where the little ones are, and you can, we can pierce the vessel. Not a big deal, because if we inject the anesthetic, put a little pressure on the eye, the bleeding would stop. But if you were on a blood thinner, such as Coumadin, Plavix, aspirin, the bleeding wouldn't stop, and there was a chance that we could choke off and obstruct the optic nerve and blood vessels and maybe even go blind. So what we used to do is tell you to stop all your anti-bleeding medications a week before. The risk was that is people could get strokes or heart attacks and there was always a tough road to walk, but we didn't want people to go blind. Well, since we don't use suit, I'm sorry, um, injections anymore, we don't ask you to stop Coumadin or Plavix or aspirin. Okay? So bleeding is almost non-existent in and around the eye. What can happen, though, is sometimes one can notice little bleeding on the surface because during the surgery, we actually hold your eye for moving, because again, your eye can move and you can focus on a little light that we ask you to, but not that we don't trust you, but we don't trust you. We um, <laughs> hold your eye in place with a, with, with a little um, holder. But truth be told, the holder has these, it's like a medieval torture device, it has these little prongs on it, which you won't feel because your eye's numb, but it holds your eye so you can't move and we can manipulate it. But where we touch you, you may develop little bruises, cosmetic things, um, and that's not a big deal. Now, a little bit about anti, you know, these bleeding medicines. Does anyone take Coumadin here? That's nice. Does anyone take Plavix? Anyone take an aspirin a day for Pete's sakes? Well, my mother sometimes takes aspirin. But, but you don't. Well, she's but, having a surgery. Oh, oh sorry. Mother. I apologize. Yes. Yeah. So, um, so if you're taking aspirin or Plavix or Coumadin on the advice of a doctor, please keep taking it. I just told you we should do that. We don't need to stop it. But many times people take aspirin, like myself, or anyone take fish oil? I do. Anyone take a multivitamin a day? I do. My multivitamin is a vitamin E. Vitamin E can make you bleed. So if you're taking a vitamin a day, fish oil, or an aspirin because you think it's a good thing, and it is, you can still keep taking it. However, if you decide you don't want to get bruising on your eye or have a less chance of a red eye, you may want to stop those a week before. These are just medicines you're taking kind of like as an over-the-counter type thing. Aspirin, fish oil, multivitamin. If you don't stop, it's not the end of the world, but one less chance of bruising. The other option if we want to talk about or problem is infection. Infection would be horrible if you got it in your eye. You could lose your vision, lose your eye, and we're, we'd be devastated. The risk of infection vary from place to place, but typically it's between 1 in 600 and 1 in 1,000. Downstairs, I think we're about 1 in 1,250. Um, I've had 
two in my career since 1994. So either I'm a really, really good surgeon, nope, has nothing to do with it. I'm really lucky, could be. I think it has to do with what I'm going to ask you to do now, and that's my patients do what I tell them to do, and that's take some medicines before and after surgery, one of which is an antibiotic eye drop. We start these drops two days before surgery. So when you take it two days before, one day before, and the day of, we take over downstairs by giving you antibiotics and we put special preps and paints on your eye. We're sterilizing them together, we're sterilizing your eye. And because we can start the eye drops directly after surgery, since you're not patched, the antibiotics start up within three hours after surgery, so by keeping antibiotics going, we don't expect an infection. But I can't do it for you before, and I can't do it for you when you go home, which means if you follow the rules, I'm not expecting a problem. The same sort of thing. Do what I tell you to do, and it'll work out fine. Um, I think it's really important. So, you know, it, it all works out well. Um, the last complication, which is rare, but this is something called informed consent. You've got to know what I know. Um, as we are chopping out the cataract with the ultrasound, if the sac is not of proper strength, or the ligaments aren't of proper strength, and what I mean by that is, are they normal? Now, I don't know that. I can't see them. I can't evaluate them until we actually get into surgery. If there's a problem with them, instead of the cataract being removed, it may break through and fall back. Not one of the best things in the world to happen. We'll talk about that. Um, so if, and the reason why that would happen, if the sac is good but not of good quality, when we're hitting it with this ultrasound at 20,000 cycles per second, if the sac is weak, it could break. Or if, this, or if the ligaments are weak, and there are certain disease entities that you, we don't know until we get into the eye and actually look, so as we're moving around in there, could give way. Um, depending on what was the problem and whether or not Joey would come out and you'd have to take care of that, we then can still do the second part of the surgery, and that's the lens implant. But it's really tongue-in-cheek, I've removed your cataract, it's not here anymore. It's just not out of your eye, but it's not here. And what we would then do, depending on if there's just a little opening in the sac, we can still put an implant in. There's nothing wrong with that. Remember, we open the sac later too in time. If the sac is too big an opening, but the ligaments are fine, we can still put it in behind the iris and in front of the sac, and that's fine. It works just great. The reason for mentioning it is you cannot live life with a lens in your eye, or, or a lens nucleus in your eye, which means sometime in the next day, two, three, or four, you'll have the opportunity to visit one of my retinal surgeon friends, and they'll have the opportunity to perform a second surgery, where they make a little opening, just like we do in the cornea, in the wall of the eye. They reach through with an ultrasound and gobble it up here. We can't access it from our, our our openings in the front of the eye, and in fact, it would be wrong to do so. So that's called um, a drop nucleus. I've had six. That's been in about 10 years, so it's rare. Um, if it happens, you'll be the second person to know about it. Um, the people have all had these six people. They all see fine. They're all 20, 25 or better. The problem is it's a little anxiety-provoking that you have to have a second surgery, but you need to know this. So it's rare. It's about one in about four or 500 is where it runs up to. So do you still put the new lens in and the other guy goes and gets he goes in, out? Right, exactly. So just uh, is another thing you have to do because you can't leave that in your eye. You leave the high pressure inflammation. So I just mentioned it's rare. I don't expect it. Um, and if we do get in the eye and we see that there's some abnormalities of the strength, there are other things we do. We can lose hooks and stuff, and usually we can, we can capture that. and We notice it, but sometimes it happens right off the bat, and that's when it's like, darn. That's my four-letter exploits of the leader. Um, so what else can we talk about? Um, any questions about complications at all? If, if it would happen, I mean, you said the ligaments and stuff hold the sac in. Will the ligaments attach to the, I mean, what's going to attach to the implant to hold it? If the ligaments are fine, but it's a, it's a laxity to the skin, then they're fine. And it makes no difference because the opening doesn't make a difference at all. Okay. So I told you we could open it later. If the ligaments are loose, um, you can still put them in front of them. They can actually still as a, as a, as a uh, backdrop. If their ligaments aren't there, what would we do, for example? What we used to do 25 years and 30 years ago, we put the implant in front of the iris. So I think I've done that once in about a couple of decades. So typically the ligaments are fine. The question is, do you put it in the sac or in front, depending on what, what it has, what, what, what it is available. Well, let's talk a little bit about some multifocal implants, because I think that's an important thing. And, and you need to know that to make decisions on where you go. Uh, this is not meant to be an advertisement or an advertorial by any means, but just like I've told you, I want to tell you about things that are offer, offered to you. Cataract surgery, as I mentioned in the old days, was a, was a big deal. 
it's a big deal anyway. It's a nice, it's a big surgery, but with the stitches and the three months or four months post-operatively, um, where you have to take stitches out, and we really didn't care if you had astigmatism or at or how how good or bad you saw, because your everyone's going to wear an eyeglass. It was a given. You needed an eyeglass because you have astigmatism, and you need to have reading glasses because you're old. So. Where we've come to today is we look at cataract surgery as a refractive surgery. I'm a cornea, LASIK cataract specialist. People have been, I've been doing LASIK for 20 years. And what we try to do is get people out of glasses, or at least that's my mind think. We don't have to, but we have the opportunity. In cataract surgery, we can, if you wish, put an implant in your eye and make it so you won't need to wear glasses. And I'll tell you how, how this works. After cataract surgery, the reason why people wear glasses are twofold. Everyone has astigmatism going into surgery. And those of you who are operating on, you may remember that I did a little test on you where you would look into a, a little machine that had a round circle on it, it's a white circle, and measured your astigmatism. We also measured your astigmatism with something called topography, which is this mapping of your eye. Astigmatism, while that's a nasty word, this affects vision just like nearsightedness and farsightedness. Just another way of you not seeing one. And everyone has it in their glasses. Docs don't go around saying, oh, you're nearsighted, and astigmatism. We just say you're nearsighted or farsighted and leave it at that. But truth be told, everyone has some. We can negate most of the nearsighted and farsightedness with the implants. We can't touch your astigmatism with an implant. Um, there are some implants, people have a lot of it, a lot of astigmatism that are called toric implants. We can put them in, but typically that's few and far between. So people with a little astigmatism that will blur vision and need glasses, that's why you don't see well after cataract surgery. And so you can correct it with glasses. Also, after cataract surgery, because implants don't correct reading and we're all old, we all need reading glasses that I have in my pocket, you'll wear a reading glass, which means you'll wear an all line bifold, which is fine. If you want to get rid of either of the distance or reading, here's how we do it. In order to get rid of the astigmatism <coughs> during surgery, we perform a procedure called an astigmatic keratotomy. It's astigmatism management. I've been doing that for 25 years. And we use a knife, and we make a cut, and it negates it. Um, that would clear your distance, so you could walk around like me and see well without glasses for distance. But since I'm 54 and I wear reading glasses, you'd have to put them on. If you wish then not to wear the reading glass component, the way that works is we use these multifocal or accommodating implants. The idea of these implants is to help you read up close. So using um, this is a model, you probably can't see it, but this is a model of a, an Acrosoft lens. And the Acrosoft lens has one continuous prescription that when we put it in the eye, it will correct for distance. If we correct for astigmatism, then you see well without glasses, except for reading glasses. The model of a Restore lens is the same distance prescription, but within it has nine different rings that focus at different lengths, starting at about 16 or 14 inches, and moving out to infinity, which is out here. So if we correct the distance component, then the reading works as well. Is that the actual size that's going in my mother's eye? No, these are, these are <laughs> so you and I can talk about them. Oh, I was going to say, my God, but, but the actual size of the lens is actually, I can't see it, the lens actually is 6 millimeters by 14 millimeters sitting right in there. They're very oh, small. Okay, I'm but say. It, 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 it's for the uh, viewing appreciation of the audience. Um, the other lenses that work, so these are called um, multifocal, different focal lenses. There's another lens called a crystal lens. And these are accommodative. The way this works is, again, this is inside the sac. And just so you know how the anatomy of the eye works, those little ligaments I told you about, they just do more than just hold it. They move. And when we're younger, the ligaments move in. When you want to read, it makes the lens fatter and you can read up close. And when you look far away, they expand and you see far away. So the way these are, are, are made, they're little hinges, and so when it's in the eye, as the lens sac compresses, it pushes it forward for reading, and goes back for distance. Pretty cool. They both work really well. Different processes, and depending on how the sac in the eye is, sometimes they're good benders or not, we, you know, we can use this, or we can use this. And depending on, and, and there's another lens as well called a technus, which is on a similar scale as this. So there's lots of, of these lenses. They're now in the fifth generation. Generations one and two are pretty much awful. 
I didn't put any of them in. I kind of watched because it just didn't make sense. And more were explanted than were implanted. Anyway, when third generation came around about six years, actually about seven years ago, we started putting them in. Uh, and my mother-in-law had one about five years ago. Um, and she likes it. We're now in generation five, and they're really, really good. Um, are they for everybody? If you ask me, would I do this in everyone? Absolutely. There's no question. Technology's great. But there's a cost involved, and because of that, we don't put them in everyone. So um, we can talk to Donna about the costs for the astigmatic component, if you just want to see for distance with reading glasses, or the cost for the astigmatic component with the implant. And we can mention, talk about that later if you want. Um, that is all I have to talk about for multifocals. Questions? On the multifocal, I guess when you're in, you will make the decision whether you're going to put in the one with the rings or the ones that will. It's a, good, it's a really good question. Um, hopefully I've made it this, actually I pick about six or seven lenses that I have to go in and I have my, my models pretty much chosen in my head and on paper. Um, before cataract surgery, there's a form that we ask you to fill out, kind of a lifestyle form. We kind of call these lifestyle lenses. They really make you more like you're normal again. And when you fill out the lifestyle form, there's certain questions that are psychometropic um, questions, um, where it lets me know what your risks and, and tolerances are for certain things. And depending on what your needs are, we try to focus these lenses. Truth be told, these lenses are really great, and, and but they're not perfect in everything. So um, the crystal lenses and uh, and the um, restores and um, technus are all great at distance. The technus is better also if you have to choose in the mid-distance than the restores are, but the restores are better up close. So there's three zones of vision, and each of them are better in two than the third, but they're all good. Depending on which your needs are, we try to tape, talk, you know, taper it. Now, truth be told, if I get in the eye and I see something I don't like, and the sac is, is not strong, or if I don't like the way things are looking, I, I can flip-flop. Really, the results are good for all of them. There are guys in town who only put one lens in, and I don't see how you can be married to one lens, just like... You know, I'm not married to one anything. I think they all have their benefits and their, and their shortcomings. But truth be told, I would tell you that 97% of the time, 95% of the time, when you walk around, you'd be fine for normal activities. What I don't consider a normal activity is reading a phone book, not a three-point type. Maybe reading the obituaries, going to a restaurant in really nice low mood lighting and trying to read. In those cases, you may have to carry a small pen light like I do, or maybe a small reading glass. But for the vast majority of things, sitting down, reading, getting around with your watch, um, looking at the dashboard, they weren't fine. So before I conclude, are there any questions about how cataracts are taken out, what we do, why we do it, risks, or anything on the multifocal lenses? Thanks for sitting here. I really appreciate your, your time today.